You've just been through a grueling job interview. 45 minutes of learning about corporate policy and the dental plan and the salary package and where you're supposed to park your car. But there's one more detail. Sometime in that interview with your would-be boss, you need to take a deep breath and ask this one important question. But Mr. Boss, what exactly is my job? What am I supposed to do? Right now we're sailing into the thick of one of this world's most important discussions. We could title it, How to Know God, or we could use our devotional title, Your Most Radical Decision. But somewhere in this process of really becoming a follower of Jesus Christ comes this question, pounding home, what is our job? In the salvation experience, what do we do? Do we try to be good? Do we clean up our act and then come to the foot of the cross? Do we simply sing, I surrender all? I think we can all accept and understand and appreciate that God does the saving but what are we to accomplish? Do we even do anything? Maybe you've heard of the four spiritual laws, or perhaps for you they were called the seven secrets of salvation. One of the favorite classic Christian books in my denomination is entitled Steps to Christ, and it has 13 chapters. Is that a magic number? <laughs> the wonderful Quaker writer from the last century, Hannah Whittle Smith, describes how a man was converted to Christianity and was asked, what exactly was your part and what was God's part? I want you to notice this answer, which I don't think was too far from the truth. The man looked down and then said, my part was to run and God's part was to catch me. All through this Radical Decision series, we're drawing gratefully from Morris Venden's wonderful book, How to Know God, A Five-Day Plan. It tells the story of an old man who stood up in a camp meeting revival and said with tears in his eyes, for a long time, God tried to get me, and he finally got me. As we focus especially on what's involved in the salvation process, I want to emphasize over and over that God basically does it all. Jesus told us in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. We find the same truth in the Old Testament. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. That's Jeremiah 31, verse 3. In Venden's book, To Know God, he shares five steps. And you know, I'm amazed as I consider them. All five of them seem to be on God's side of the ledger. They're all things that He does for us. Here's step number one, a desire for something better. Of course, this one is obvious. We're not going to want a relationship with God until we realize that there's got to be something better than what we've got right now. A lot of the mail we received at our media center when I served there at the Voice of Prophecy, it came from people who had just hit this realization. Their lives were totally thrashed. They'd hit rock bottom. And they cry out, Dear Pastor Meloshenko, things can't get worse. Please, please help me. And praise God, it is God who has brought them to that realization. In the great Bible story where Jesus sits down, remember, with a Samaritan woman at the well in the city of Sychar, an interesting conversation takes place. Now, this woman has a tough B-minus grade life, five husbands, and now a live-in lover. We think we're sophisticated here in the 2020s. This woman had discovered the sorry treadmill of musical partners 2,000 years ago, and she was tired of it. Despite her active social life, she was lonely. She was looking for something better. And Jesus asked just the right questions to draw out that pain, to get her to face up to the fruitlessness of how she was living. And it takes some of us, you know, a long time before God can lead us to see the emptiness of doing things our way, just like that woman at the well. A lot of people today have had five husbands, 50 sexual partners, 
You remember how a few years ago the NBA's Wilt Chamberlain bragged about how many women he had had in his bed hopping career? But you know, a person who's had 50 sexual partners or 5,000 of them can have had a very fulfilling time with any one of them. People go from wedding chapel to wedding chapel looking for that one magic person who will make them long-term happy. I read something heart-chilling the other day. It's from a Max Lucado book called No Wonder They Call Him the Savior. Really great stuff. Well, he writes about a girl named Judith Bucknell. Nothing especially wonderful about her. Just your regular 30-something, 40 hours a week, beat your brains into pay the bills woman. But she went through a cycle of looking for love that would really break your heart. 59 lovers in 56 months. One after the other. Just a stream of failed relationships. And she writes it all down in a diary that got left behind when Judith Bucknell was stabbed to death and strangled at the age of 38. Listen to this. This is what she wrote in her diary. Where are the men with the flowers and champagne and music? Where are the men who call and ask for a genuine actual date? Where are the men who would like to share more than my bed, my booze, my food? I would like to have in my life once before I pass through my life the kind of sexual relationship which is part of a loving relationship. She never did. Judith Bucknell wore designer clothes, hosted parties, and had a great apartment overlooking the bay in Coconut Grove, Florida. And her heart was breaking from loneliness. Right at the end, she wrote this. I see people together, and I'm so jealous, I want to throw up. What about me? What about me? Friend, she was looking for something better. What a tragedy that for her that something better didn't come in time. But for the woman sitting with Jesus at the well, and for you and me here today, we can make the wonderful discovery of step number two, a knowledge of what it is that's better. There's got to be something better, we cry out. Surely this mess I'm experiencing now can't be all there is. Yes, there is something better. And here's what it is. God's gift of salvation. God's promised gift is absolutely free, no charge whatsoever, no strings attached, gift of salvation and eternal life. Now that's what he described to the woman sitting there at the well. And it's the very same gift today. How many times can I use the word gift in this talk? Salvation, friend, is a gift. It's free. There's no price tag, not for you to pay anyway. God wants to give it to you right now. The idea that salvation is a free gift is the most often explained and often forgotten idea in Christianity. God keeps saying it, and the devil keeps burying it. Don't ever forget that salvation is a gift. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you know I've quoted Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 so many times that the Apostle Paul wants to charge me royalties on it. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. My friend Venden likes to say, we can't earn it. We can't purchase it. We can never merit it. Salvation is a gift. But now notice... This next line, it has no relationship to what we deserve. Now, right here, we almost have to check our pulse and have someone throw a glass of cold water in our faces because our whole world is built on the idea that, well, you get what you deserve. Work a day, get a day's pay. Be good to others, they'll be good to you. Plant pumpkin seeds and you get pumpkins. But in heaven's plan of salvation, we don't get what we do deserve, and we do get what we don't deserve. 
Just recently, Jeannie and I took our frequent flyer, free air miles, and spent two weeks in merry old England in connection with the British Open PGA golf tournament. It was about the time of our 54th wedding anniversary, and we were both really, really excited about it. But now, suppose, just suppose, that Jeannie and I decided to spend an afternoon in that most exclusive of London establishments, Harrods Department Store. Now, I imagine that if I were to take U.S. dollars there, Harrods would find a way to take my dollars and figure the correct change rate in British pounds. But suppose, in this parable, suppose I were to show up at Harrods with a whole pocket full of Monopoly money, a suitcase full of orange $500 bills in Monopoly money. Frankly, when you see the prices there, you're almost tempted to do this. <laughs> you know what Harrods is going to say? Uh, Mr. Meloshenko, we're dreadfully sorry, but your money's simply no good here. We cannot accept it. But this is all I've got, I protest. I brought this orange money all the way from America. Uh, yes, sir, quite right. Jolly good. We understand. But we're just on a different system here. Monopoly money is out of favor, unfortunately. It simply doesn't work. So many of us are convinced that our good deeds and our proper religious behavior earn us, if not a whole ticket to heaven, at least part of a ticket. Surely all the good things we've done count for something. But no, God's plan of salvation. We discover in that plan, God's on a completely different financial system altogether. Our money's no good. But we don't need money because salvation is a gift. Praise God. There's more yet to come, so stay tuned.